Hi there. Good afternoon, everybody. Um, thanks so much for joining. It's really nice. This is like the first physical event that I've done for a couple of years now. So it's really nice to be in a real space with real people. Um, so today uh, we're, we're coming together to talk specifically about materials and materiality. Um, my name's Caroline Till. I'm co-founder of a futures research studio called Franklin Till. Um, we work with a range of um, sort of mainly large scale corporations across the world to help instigate particularly material innovation to lead them towards um, uh, more sustainable innovation. Um, we also, I also co-authored a book called Radical Matter, Rethinking Materials for a More Sustainable Future. So um, having trained originally as a textile designer, materiality is kind of, is my, my real passion. And I'm I, you know, always thinking, obviously the most effective thing we can do as designers is, is stay in bed in terms of sustainability. But we have this, this inherent need to kind of, to, to make, to work to, with materials, to feel them in our hands. So how can we do that more, more you know, with, with greater consideration? I just wanted to start with it's probably a tiny bit of doom and gloom, but just to set some context and maybe just to give some references. Obviously, in the wake of, of the, the recent IPCC report, uh, report um, which is showing that you know, our processes of extraction, uh, production, and consumption of materials have you know, are really reaching catastrophic levels of impact in terms of you know, the detrimental impact to, to biodiversity and indeed all living life on the planet. Um, there's also a really interesting recent report um, in the scientific journal Nature, which cited that human-made mass now exceeds the weight of all living biomass on the planet. So the, the, the mass of, of human-made materiality is now exceeding that of, of, of living biomass, which seems quite an extreme tipping point. So I suppose what you know, we want to explore today is how we can really be very considerate as designers in terms of where materials are coming from, the processes that we're putting them through, and indeed, you know, what happens to them at the end of life. So, um, yeah, today we've got four amazing designers um, to, to talk about their individual practices, and at the end we'll come together to sort of have some, some key questions around our materiality, um, and then hopefully involve you guys in the conversation for a Q&A. So I'm, I'm just going to allow them to, to introduce themselves through a few slides and their amazing work. So yeah, thanks for joining us. And I think first we've got Peter Marigold. Thanks very much, Caroline. Um, should I click something? Oh, hang on. Uh, it's somebody else's presentation. Uh, I think it's someone else's. Oh, it is, there you go. Um, I had a completely different presentation prepared at one o'clock this morning <laughs> about an exhibition that I'm doing um, in, um, uh, in King's Cross. So please do come and visit the, the show, the unboxing show, where we're making things from cardboard. It's all about materiality and um, the creative process. But I'm going to do a whistle-stop tour through um, some of my projects, which are very, very material orientated. I'm a furniture maker, um, but I do, do lots and lots of different things from um, public artwork to software now and um, everything in between, gallery work, mass production. Um, so this is a, a whistle-stop tour. This is one of my graduation projects, um, um, a shelving unit that's made of these uh, sliced cabinets, these sliced diagonals, sliced rectangles, which, which wedge, wedge into different spaces. And I was interested to uh, make a piece of furniture that could adapt to different spaces. No matter where you went, you could always take it with you and it would always change and adapt to fit the, um, the new space. Um, I've worked with lots of different materials. Um, I've got a background in sculpture originally, and then I moved into prop making and scenography and costumes, and did really did everything in between in, in lots of different materials. But when I, I studied at the Royal College of Art doing product design, um, I started visiting factories and, and working with sort of more um, sort of industrial materials. So this is EPP, which is expanded polypropylene. Um, quite complex in terms of sustainability because it's an extremely eco-friendly product with. Um, but it's petroleum based. Um, anyway, I won't go too much into that. It's what they make bicycle helmets out of. Very, very lightweight, so it saves a huge amount of fuel, but you'll, you'll not really come across that piece of information. Um, uh, this is a, a shelving system that I developed. I'm very interested in geometry and the, 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 the profundity of, of geometry, transcending material. 
And that's something that stayed with me throughout my life. I've always been extremely bad um, at mathematics, and this is a, a piece of furniture that's based on a mathematical principle that if you split a circle or any object into uh, components, the total of the interior angles is always 360 degrees. So each of, each of those boxes is made from a single piece of wood split into four, inverted, and it creates a perfectly complete shape. So each piece is perfectly irregular, but at the same time, it's perfectly complete. It's about kind of seeing the cosmos in, um, in a, every object. Um, as I've got older, I've kind of looked at sort of decay. I think you sort of start thinking about mortality and, and, and death, I guess, and, and that you see how things don't stay the same when, you, when, you're in, uh, when you're making a piece of furniture, or particularly plastic products, you think that they last forever, and you start to realize that's not the case. Things are constantly in flux. And I made a series of pieces, such as these cabinets, which are based on the, the degradation of um, wood interacting with metal. These are called the bleed series, where nails are bathed in, um, the cabinets are bathed in hydrochloric acid, which strips off the protection of the nails. And then you have this chemical reaction between the nails and the wood. It's called um, ebonization. So this is kind of localized ebonization. Um, it's called the bleed series. It's kind of a word play on the idea that they're kind of mortal, as well as just literally chemically bleeding. Um, I do work with, with, with mass production. I do work with manufacturers as well, and uh, they, uh, they sometimes see something that I might have done for a gallery and ask for a mass production version of it. So this is a piece that, that we do with SCP, um, which uses a similar principle. It's manufactured from six millimeter steel, extremely heavy steel, um, folded. It's based on um, what you see around railways. And then the, it's galvanized, but then it's bathed in, in hydrochloric acid again, which strips away the, the top coating and leaves behind this incredibly rich, complex patina. Um, this was something I was spotting around children's playgrounds. I've got two children. And you often see around handrails where children's hands have worn away the top layer of the galvanization right down to the steel, the raw, raw steel. And, um, and then at the same time, it's polished it extremely, extremely well. So it's kind of, it's called, it's called transubstantiation, where one material replaces another. And I thought that was, it kind of leaves behind a very strong kind of visual narrative. So that's what these pieces were about. Um, I'm not going to talk about that one. I'm more about sort of geometry and symmetry. Um, it's, sorry, oh, how do I go backwards? Uh, how do I go, oh, no. Sorry. <laughs> um, I've been really interested in symmetry over the years. It, it's got this incredibly strong visual effect. When you see something symmetrical, um, it, it kind of links you to everything in the planet. If you see something vertically symmetrical, it means it's either standing up, it's either to mate with or to eat, or you should run away from it. it and and it's, it centers you to the center of the planet. So I was struck by this kind of incredibly powerful um, visual, the psychological effect that symmetry, vertical symmetry, has on you. So I made these cabinets which are half cast and half, um, half mold and half cast. And this was a piece that I showed here in, I think, 2010, which was it's a 3D printed log. I was asked to work with a 3D printed company. I and mean, instead of kind of doing a 3D model, we just chopped a, a log in half, kind of vaguely sculpted the top, and then 3D scanned it and reflected it inside the computer. So it's a kind of natural, unnatural object, which is perfectly, the data is perfectly symmetrical. Um, um, I do work with lots of different, uh, I have did lots of different ways of working and um, I work with some Japanese craftsmen um, and this is a, a bench that I made with them called the Dodai bench which is also, it's symmetrical but it's horizontally symmetrical, it's one giant log split into two and then it's used as the opposing, fen the opposing sides of the, the bench. Um, and then I converted that into another project where the symmetry was very front facing. So this is the kind of conclusion of that project, which is an ongoing thing. Um, so each, each cabinet is made by um, uh, chopping, a, clefting a giant log in half and then turning those into the, the cabinet doors. I think the V&A has got the one on the, on the middle. Um, and I do work at lots and lots of different scales. So this is a, a public artwork which I've never actually seen due to, due to COVID. It's up in Scotland in a hospital. It's a wall that's 188 meters long. It's a very, very large object. And it's got um, uh, scans of different patients and staff and different people associated with the hospital. We, we scanned their, their skin textures and magnified them to create these giant concrete casts. Um, so it kind of looks like stone. Again, it's this transubstantiation quality where one material looks like another or is replaced by another material. So I've never seen that finished, but it is actually finished. Um, and I think I'll kind of stop there. That's another public artwork. Oh, no, no. So there's, um, I also manufacture a product. It's a bioplastic called Form Card, which is made from potato skins and um, different starches. 
It's a medical product, um, and I manufacture it as kind of credit cards. And uh, I launched that on Kickstarter in, I can't remember, years ago. And that's like a big part of my life. It melts in hot water, and you can use it to fix things and make things. Um, I made it for myself. I knew that it, I knew that this was the kind of thing that everybody could use. And um, we could talk more about that later, but I, I make artworks from it as well. And this is an image of the show that I'm working on at the moment down in King's Cross. Um, I have a CNC cardboard cutting machine, which is amazingly good fun. And people can come there. There was nothing shipped to the exhibition. All the designers were shipped. Oh, sorry, I was rambling on too long. No. Oh, OK. I thought you were. Oh, I thought you were signaling me to shut up. Okay, so um, the, nothing was shipped to the exhibition, which was kind of response to the pandemic, where you can connect to people in lots of different countries. So we've got the Campana brothers from Brazil, Chen and Kai from New York, there's, there's Yuri Suzuki. There, there's lots of different people, and everybody just sent me the files, and the machine cuts them out. And you can actually come to the exhibition and make those objects as well. So we can cut out the objects, and you can have super, super collectible objects. You can have a Campana brother bowl, and it's stamped and numbered. So I'd make one of those if I were you. Um, it's great, great, great fun. This is a table from Faye Too Good. I think that's it. Thank you. Hello. Good afternoon. So I'm waiting for the, um, the presentation. Voila. Hello, everyone. So my name is Jesenia Thibault Picasso. I'm one half of Wax Atelier. We are a studio and a brand. Uh, we're specialized in wax. Um, we are basically revisiting all traditional um, techniques using wax, natural waxes. Uh, and we create collections uh, such as candles, uh, wax textiles goods, such as lunch bags, um, how do you say, like uh, food wraps, uh, candle holders, many things. Um, so. I'm going to tell you a bit more about who we are uh, initially. So I'm the co-founder with, uh, together with uh, my colleague and friend Lola Lely. Uh, a bit about me. Um, so basically, I uh, initiated a practice a few years ago in 2013 after graduating uh, from Central St. Martins, Material Futures. Uh, I'm very interested in our relationship with materials, natural materials, and really trying to understand our impact as, as a, our impact as a species, as humans, uh, what are the traces that we're leaving behind? Uh, how are we utilizing basically the natural resources um, in our planet? So this, as an example, is a cabinet of future geology, uh, which is basically the result in a few uh, uh, thousand years of how our activities, industrial activities, are impacting the planet Earth. Um, so basically, my practice really involves collaborations, discussions with different experts in the science, such as geologists, anthropologists, um, and voila. So this is another example how plastic is basically uh, impacting the planet Earth, and how this could potentially be in the future uh, a future resource that makers, uh, humans, will be uh, utilizing. My other uh, half, other half of uh, Wax Atelier, is named Lola Lely. She is a graduate from RCA. Um, she trained as a furniture designer, though um, since the last 10 years, she's been basically uh, developing a practice that is really uh, experimental. She was really lucky basically to be commissioned uh, by galleries, by uh, commissioners to develop um, projects that don't uh, uh, expect like a final product. She's really about like exploring different techniques and really engaging uh, uh, audiences uh, of makers, non-makers uh, within how our, her work. She's developed as well uh, quite a nice um, expertise uh, of plant-based uh, dyeing, natural dyeing. Um, and yeah, she's like, it's really about exploration. And this is something that, that really kind of brings us together. 
And then a few years ago, we were invited to a lecture in Central St. Martins. Uh, and our brief basically consisted in uh, asking students to look at one material. Um, and by focusing like that, we really ask them to explore, understand what is the ecosystem behind uh, a material, uh, meaning that what are what is a source, uh, what are the political, economical implications of that, what is the past, uh, the techniques that have been used, what is its future. And this, um, the aim was really to question our like, future, the, the sustainable future. And this method, we basically decided, uh, Lola and myself, uh, to try it ourselves. So we were basically collaborating sometimes uh, over the last uh, seven years, uh, coming together for, for different projects, different types. But there we really uh, came together around this idea of wax, around this material and started basically really looking like what is it made of. Uh, so we have beeswax, but we have many other types of waxes. And we were super curious about um, the infinite opportunities of this material. It's been used since prehistory as a first form of plastic. Uh, it has like great properties. It's water repellent, uh, quite antibacterial. And as we started looking uh, into the techniques that have been used, we were quite surprised and, and, and interested by the candle dipping technique, which we actually started um, experimenting ourselves. Uh, and very quickly, so we decided to like build our own tools. This was in our studio. And very quickly, we decided to involve people. Uh, so we ran these workshops very quickly uh, to engage people, again, makers, non-makers. Uh, and it was really nice moment to actually share a technique, talk about um, where does, where, what is this material, where it, does it come from, uh, really kind of making people aware. So that was back like three, four years ago. Today, we've developed into a, a, a proper brand, a proper studio. Um, this is a, a shot, like recently shot, of our collections of candles. Uh, we're basically looking into plant-based waxes uh, to give us the color of our candles. So this is really like uh, the research that we've done, the, the involvement of uh, experts of wax, because there, there are uh, experts of wax, uh, really discussions that came and fed uh, our, our researchers. Uh, so here, an example is uh, a close view of green tea wax, which is a, a byproduct of the green tea industry. And on the, on the, on the left is um, basically the samples that we create, like the different shades. And as a result, these are the kind of candles and the palette of greens that we're able to, um, to obtain from this natural material. So it's really like we work in creating these blends of, uh, from beeswax and other uh, natural uh, waxes that we can source and that are basically not used yet in the, in the craft industry. These are more used for the uh, cosmetics industry or uh, the food industry or derived from that. This is another of our palettes, which use uh, orange wax, which is again like a bioproduct bio from the orange juice industry. So we obtain from that uh, a rich palette from rich orange to browns. Um, and then other techniques that we explore are textiles, wax textiles. So uh, with uh, my background in textiles, Lola's uh, expertise in, in textile dyeing, uh, we combine that and uh, we really like, uh, we were super curious to, to see how a combination of wax and textiles could, um, how it could benefit. So basically we create these uh, material that, that are quite water repellent. Uh, we hand dye it with natural materials again, madder, crouch, marigold. This is an example of the, the collections that we, that we create, our lunch bags. Very simple object, practical object uh, that is hand dyed, um, very slowly made. And again, using this property of, um, of uh, water repellent uh, that the wax brings to, to textile, we developed a, a range of uh, food wraps. So like this idea of food preservation really interests us, this idea of simplicity that it can, yeah, that it can bring. And surprisingly, another 
technique that's used, that involves wax, is the lost wax uh, technique uh, that is super old. So we use it to develop uh, a range of, of candle holders here. Up. And lately, um, we basically have been invited in, two, in 2020 by a charity named Participatory City Foundation. Um, they were looking basically for designers to bring uh, on the table um, uh, a design, an idea. Uh, their aim was to basically um, invite the community uh, in Parking and Dagenham, so East London, uh, to develop, to produce a series of a collection of, of, uh, of goods. Uh, and that was absolutely the right moment for us, where we basically needed to upscale, and it was really making sense for us as well with this idea of sharing skills. This is something that always has uh, passionated uh, both of us. Um, so in 2020, we trained a cohort of 20 makers. We now have like reduced it to a 10 uh, makers that um, are producing our goods in Barking, in a factory. Um, we're super proud. Um, of, of that kind of result. So basically they're producing candles, all our waxed goods, and yeah, really it's kind of making a real sense uh, to, like we have been training a, a cohort of, of non-makers, people that uh, were interested to learn more, uh, that had maybe like a, uh, yeah, a knowledge in, in making, but now like, yeah, they're part of a community and we're bringing back employment and uh, a manufacturing of, of goods, knowing that Barking was basically a house a few decades ago to like manufacture, uh, but everything has been moved away. So yeah, we're really happy to bring back a bit of uh, activity and employment and, and yeah, voila. So that will be a wrap. <laughs> Thank you. So, hello, um, my name is Matt Collins. I'm a furniture designer. Um, I'm originally from Nottingham, but traveled to Newcastle to study 3D design at Northumbria University. Um, I haven't got quite as long a presentation as the other guys, there's only a couple of slides. Uh, but just to start off, um, this is a project that I've just worked on that I launched with a company called Varney, um, which is on display at the 2021 showroom in Islington. Uh, and this was all a kind of project about using a single material. So Varney are a company in their infancy, they've only just launched. Um, but their whole idea was looking at this material that had in the past maybe been overlooked or perhaps assigned to be in a material used for just prototyping or things that aren't particularly valuable or carry that perceived value at least. Um, and so they asked a series of designers to come up with a load of products that could be designed and made from this material that could be sourced from a woodland that's local to the makers in Finland and using a material that's fast growing, um, but equally can still last just as long as any other hardwood timber piece of furniture. Um, and the idea that this thing would ultimately change with time and that we shouldn't kind of buy things and cling on to the idea of something being perfect from the very beginning and that it will also be perfect at the very end, that actually we should accept the dints and the scrapes and the scuffs and the fact that this material is going to go from being a really pale timber object through to eventually being something quite dark and rich and yellow and that that's okay and we should allow the material to inform the trends. Um, but yeah, if you can get over to the 2021 store, the whole collection is there in Islington, and there's some other incredible designers involved in the project, industrial facility and soft rock. Uh, some more pictures. Um, another project that I've worked on recently was with uh, Wallpaper Magazine and AHEC for the Design Museum. Uh, the project was entitled Discovered. Uh, in the past, they'd run these sort of projects and had gone to and collected a roster of really experienced designers, whereas for this project, uh, they invited 20 young designers from around the world to offer a platform to explore new forms and new ideas and explore with a material that they might not have used before. Um, if you don't know AHEC, they're the American Hardwoods uh, Export Council, and they kind of gave us lessons along the way about the use of certain, certain timbers and using seasonal timbers and things that could be felled 
in a way that encourages the rejuvenation of woodlands um, and kind of clearing space for new growth, but using the timbers that are ready to go instead of timbers that are desirable at the time. Um, and this was my contribution to this project. It's called the Conquer Chair. Um, and for me, a lot of the work that I do is narrative driven. Uh, so it's looking to kind of work out how to communicate stories or things that matter to me, but then through this process of creating things that I enjoy, um, but also how people can interact with this material that you've manipulated in some way to then, I don't know, have a, have a certain experience. Um, and for this project, it was kind of focused around your response to isolation and your response to lockdown. But for me, um, I've always been quite an introvert and actually the term isolation had almost brought me a sense of comfort, but yet throughout the process and throughout the, the time in lockdown, I kind of lost touch with that. And so this was an opportunity to create the chair that for me would be the perfect thing to isolate myself within. Um, and again, a timber that I've never used before, which is cherry, which I kind of picked ultimately for the same reason as the, well, why I enjoy the pine from the Varney collection is that this material is another material that really, really does change within, with time. Um, and so it's quite pale, but yet you understand that in 20, 30 years time, this thing is gonna look completely different to how it was when you first bought it. And I think that's quite, a, quite an incredible thing. Um, this is actually my, uh, or at least a derivative piece from my breakout kind of project. Um, the project that I graduated with, which was entitled Eclower, um, which is ultimately this, but in blue, and having had been made by me. Um, but this whole project was, like I say, uh, this sort of narrative-driven thing where I was exploring my own identity and heritage and culture and what it really actually meant to be from the Caribbean and for, for half of my family to come from the Caribbean and come from the island of Jamaica, um, which is a place I've never visited and a place that I feel I have like a losing connection to, but is also the place that defines me as separate to the majority in some way, to the majority of the British nation. Um, and so I ended up exploring and kind of trying to trace our lineage back and understanding that we can only trace our heritage back so many years. Um, and that even when we like delve into it, we talk to the family members and people that had now moved to, to the States from, from Jamaica who could only name maybe two, three, four generations back before that until there's a point where people no longer named themselves and no longer had the right to a name because they were owned by people, other human beings. Um, and so this was a response to that. For me, it was an opportunity to kind of go against that and to create something that would empower somebody and that if they were to use this thing and sit in it, they would feel almost the antithesis of what I had felt while carrying out this research. Um, and had this big, large backrest that you could feel in your peripheral vision when you sat in it and to know that you're kind of supported and protected by this object, but then also to feel these spear-like forms that kind of strike through from the back and protect this person within this thing. Um, but then also put them in this nonchalant kind of lounge sitting position that is so sort of synonymous with my Caribbean family members um, and the attitudes that they have when they go about their daily lives and the attitudes that they had when they arrived in this country during the Windrush generation. Um, this is another project that I've just released uh, a couple of days ago with the New Craftsman, which is over at their gallery in Mayfair. Um, less kind of personal, but again, a kind of building on this narrative from this portrait of place. Um, but in a way, it's, it's really important for me and for this project that we were using kind of English timbers and trying to commu communicate this location in Norfolk. And that's pretty much it. So just back to this is the collection for Varney, um, but I'll, I'll leave it there, but thank you. Hello, <laughs> another French. Uh, my name is Arthur Mamoumani, I'm, I'm an architect. Um, and this is our studio in East London. 
Um, it's very much um, an architecture studio, but also we have a, a fabrication space called the Fab Pub, which is open to all. Uh, we have kind of three meters high 3D printers and laser cutters, and the entire community comes and books them and uh, takes part of the process. So as much as uh, I love to express myself and so on through um, this sort of uh, technology, I also get the chance to, to teach it and to, uh, and to share it. And so um, you see in our studio, we have the actual things. So it's quite unusual for an architect to be able to do the one-to-one -one all the time. Uh, but I'll show you a few projects where we got a chance to do that, where we experiment straight with the machine, almost like if we had our own little factory. Um, this is at, I uh, don't know if any, uh, anyone went, it's at Burning Man in the USA. Uh, it's an event where they built a city in the desert um, and there is these principles, uh, including leave no trace. Um, and so what I find really fascinating, I brought my students there every year because um, we're not fully aware of what we need as energy or what we create as waste. And so to create a city every year and to have to be aware of what you bring and what you leave is something very powerful that taught me and many other people um, like what it is that we produce. I think you, you were showing like what we're going to leave forward. And, and so leaving no traces is the opposite uh, kind of notion that we could potentially create things that dissolve and, and, and disappear including this one that we actually uh, burned. <laughs> and uh, it's, a, it's a secular temple. Um, it's kind of a strange notion to have a, a temple that doesn't have any religion associated with it. But what was nice is it's not just the temple itself. And I show a picture of it being built. It's, we were about uh, 140 volunteers to build it over about 18 days. Um, and every day we would talk about why we're here, what does it mean for us, and the process was as much part of the build as the, the build itself. And so just coming back to London, this is in uh, near Oxford Street. Uh, this is a, a piece that's called the Wooden Waves, um, and it's made from laser cut pieces of timber. Um, we laser cut little, uh, light, what's called a lattice hinge, which allows to bend it into, uh, into places that the wood wouldn't do naturally. Uh, so just through cutting it, we can shape the geometry. What's, uh, what's lovely with this is that we can work on a module. So we have a very modular approach, which allows us to work with the constraints of the materials, the machines. Um, and, and so this has evolved in many, many different ways. Um, and we still continue to do it. So we really um, are lucky to start from a project and it ends up being a sort of product that people want and get creative with. So we have a lot of clients that are like, oh, I'd like it as a facade, I'd like it. So somehow all these projects enable the creativity of others, which is also uh, really nice. Uh, this is uh, 3D printed in sand. Uh, so it's a mixture of, of sand and a resin, uh, which we did in, in Saudi Arabia because that's the sort of local material, the sand. and. We thought it'd be interesting to see um, that's a material that's really good in, um, in, in, in compression, but not very good in tension. And so the resulting thicknesses that you're seeing is the, 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 the computer, the simulation uh, that tells us what sort of Newton goes where and therefore what sort of uh, strength needs to be added. And so it kind of looks like the, the, the leaf, you know, the, the different veins that you see and the structural needs uh, for that lattice. And in, in a similar uh, way, this is uh, Conifera. This was for uh, the Milan Design Week and, and COST. Uh, and so COST is owned by H&M, and, and they asked for a piece, and I immediately just sort of talked about fast fashion. And, and, uh, and they were very open to discussing what happens to our, um, to our waste, including plastics. And um, this is made from bioplastics. So it's made from PLA, polylactic acid. It's what you, when you run, you have a stitch that's lactic acid. And so they extract the lactic acid from any sugars or any starch, and then they spun it into giant chains of polymer, uh, which creates a plastic um, that's actually surprisingly good, about 80% less energy to do it than conventional petroleum plastic. If you drop a PLA bottle in the ocean, it, it dissolves into uh, in 24 months, as opposed to like 700 years approximately for plastic. So. I still don't know why it's not more talked about. Um, some people say it altered the pH of, of the ocean, but it's not true. Um, so I've been looking into it very deeply because a lot of journalists are questioning it and somehow everyone is throwing. So I've become a, lot, um, a bit of an expert without kind of knowing that I would become one. Um, so I looked at many uh, scientific papers to, um, to confirm these, these, these um, properties and actually stronger than 
than petroleum-based plastics. Um, so one of the issues, though, is, of course, if you were to produce this, this is made from uh, sugar canes. Uh, this is at Fortnum and Mason's right now, if you want to see it. Uh, and, uh, and basically, one of the problems, of course, where it comes from, which is uh, a renewable material, it's, it's, it's either corn or starch or beetroot or cassava, uh, but obviously it's, it's food. Um, and so we're currently exploring, you know, things like vertical gardens or vertical farms. And then there is the other part of the uh, equation, which is the, uh, the composting bit where you need composters. So it's, it's kind of nice to know that a project, an architectural project or an installation can lead towards zooming out and seeing where things come from, where things go um, in, in, in sort of infrastructural level. So what we ended up doing is, uh, partnering with an industrial group and we're going to create our own uh, PLA and we're going to create composters and crushers and and so to enable the full circle uh, for people to be able to um, to do this in a decentralized way. Um, so this is some more images. Yeah. Thank you. Hope that was five minutes. Yeah. This working? Can you hear? Yeah, is that is that off? No? I need to switch it. Hello. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, thank you so much. That I mean, that is just so rich and and so inspiring. Um, so we probably I've I've got a few questions to kick off with, but please, we'd love to to engage you guys. Um, I mean, I think there were so many sort of really rich threads and some commonality. Um, I wanted to kick off with, a, actually, sorry, a slightly off piece because I know I said I was going to ask you, but just to everyone, there was an idea that struck me that came across all of your uh, presentations about um, restriction, almost the, the idea of single material exploration. Um, and I think, you, you know, Peter, with your current project with cardboard and um, Yesenia, when you were talking about how you discovered almost, you know, wax with the, the student project and um, Mac with your project with Varney. And I just would be really interested to, to hear if you, you know, this, this notion of single singular material exploration, um, you know, does that, does that have value? Do we consider that enough or are we obsessed with combining materials? Anyone? Me? Yeah. Anyone kick off? Has um, anyone's got anything to say? So just back to that Varney project, I suppose. Um, I think what's interesting for that is that with them exploring this single material, but then through a collection of like 20 objects, that you're trying out all of these different processes um, all on the same material, and you're kind of pushing the material to, to the limits and into different areas. But then also, particularly with pine and the way that pine grows, and the same with a lot of trees, but like the first third of the tree is like generally quite straight green um, and relatively uninterrupted by knots. And then it starts to become knotty towards the top of the tree. But with them kind of using this one material, they're kind of focusing in on that and being able to use the straight longer grain for certain parts of the project, but then also being able to reserve the other knottier bits for details elsewhere in other pieces. And that you kind of, maybe if they were exploring lots of different materials within this project, you'd maybe miss out on the opportunity to use the whole of that tree and make sure that the whole thing is used as opposed to, you know. Yeah. I would say that it's really not a, a surprise or like, a, a, I would say for creative creativity, when it's focused, I remember like for anything like music, art, whenever you're like focused, you're, this is where you're the most creative because you're really going deep. Um, and here for the example of wax, um, of course, like when you start researching, you start your own research, you start discussing with experts, you, um, you discover like such an array of possibilities. Just like mentioning like the, the properties of wax, the, the properties of different waxes, so beeswax. Um, I don't know, like they're like hard waxes, um, scented waxes. That's that's just an, uh, an example. As soon as you start combining them with other materials, then another um, enormous array uh, emerges. And yeah, for sure, like that's. I think that's a method that that is really interesting if we want to push like uh, and then the formats that it takes you know like how do we engage people uh, towards that there are like products there are workshops um, and there are so many ways to tell the story of of yeah like 
just by starting by one material. And I think the, the thing that really struck me from all your all the presentations was a materials first approach. I think often as when we're trained in design education, there's a, almost like a research concept, you know, sketch what you're trying to make and make it. But I think what was really interesting is the interrogation of the materiality to begin with, to then allow, you know, to see what that can inform. Um, I don't know if anyone's got anything to say about that. Um, well, is that on? Yeah. Um, so I studied at art school first of all, and I don't know if any of you are in art school, but it's um, it's tormented by its own self-referential uh, horror. Um, and when I went to do, when I went to the RCA to do design products, it was incredibly liberating, where it felt far more artistic, where people were just diving into a singular process or really getting into metal bending, or they were just doing casting or like cheese or whatever, like a single material. And I think there's um, like a certain purity to it that is not kind of dogged by by too much information and it's this sort of naivety of diving you know when i invited people to take part in this cardboard show not one person said no you know, make something in cardboard was the only brief and everyone can just like think inside that and you jump into it with a kind of naivety that helps you yeah <clears throat> um, the, 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 the industry, um, in a way, when, when you see materials out there, um, you're not fully aware of the total life cycle of something, where it comes from or the carbon it generates. And I, we're doing our home now, we're trying to do everything with environmental products and we're struggling. And I think it's because when we produce materials in us, I mean, when we, we don't take into account the impact it has at all, like uh, in the cost. So the cheapest material are always like petroleum based, you know, epoxy and plastics is everywhere. And, 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 and so we almost as designers, architects, I don't know if it's the same for you, but I, I, we almost become scientists about stats and about um, understanding the, what's behind the material, not just the material itself, but the, 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 the impact it has before, after, the, the, even the numbers and the math, and it's complex science, climate change. So um, it, it's sort of, even though it's a focus on the material, it's actually a focus on an infrastructure. Yeah, I think that's a really key point that came out from is, is the materialist system. I think often we think of a materialist in a, is a, as a static object. And I think what you all conveyed was the, the, the element of materialist system. I wanted to kind of jump into more, uh, you know, less about the sort of individual designer process and think about the storytelling aspect. Because obviously, you know, I think that was so powerful in, in all of your presentations. And, you know, Mac, when you're talking about the cultural narrative and, and Yesenia, when you're talking about the connection of material to the natural world um, I, I guess it's a personal gripe but how important do you think it is that we can effectively communicate the story and 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 meaning of material origin to a wider audience and in, indeed are we doing that enough anyone kick off yeah it's definitely important um, I think it comes to, well, that makes me think of, uh, particularly at the minute when you see graduate shows and student shows, it seems as though that's like the key to everything now. People aren't really just like putting things out. It's everything that they're putting out tends to have some kind of moral responsibility kind of stance behind it. Um, and I think I teach at the uni at Trent and then uh, Northumbria as well. And it's like integral to everything that we're saying to the students. The, that moral responsibility is at the center of it. Um, so from that side of it, from like the designers that are then gonna be coming out into the industry, but then, yeah, from the other side of it, maybe it's not communicated clearly enough all the time. Um, yeah. I was going to say about um, self-publishing, like Kickstarter and launching your own products. Um, so I launched a product, this thing, Form Card, and I did that on Kickstarter, and that was, not only was it something that I wanted to bring into the world, I wanted to bring it myself into the world after kind of sort of nightmares with lots of um, manufacturers where they don't tell the whole story or they don't show the pictures or the angle or say the thing that you really want to say about it. They really want the kind of finished thing that looks good in the shop window. And when you do, a, when you self-publish, you take complete control of that and you are completely showing everything that you want about the products. And I think that's like a really, really important part of it. 
I would say within the actual like ecological challenge that we're facing currently, yes, it is more than important nowadays. And I think that we designers carry a big uh, a big thing here in terms of, as you were saying, like we we know where things come from. We have kind of the spectrum, and this is to us basically to share. Like today, a designer makes a lot of things. In our case, we do work our all our marketing. Uh, telling the story is like key. Uh, letting our customers, being like retailers or uh, individuals, know what it is basically and, and why that cost because it's true that things have a value. And today we need to basically really, yeah, like um, tell people and, and, and um, uh, how do you say, educate them about the why. Like this is. Uh, a material that is valuable. This has been made with time by uh, a community of, uh, of makers uh, that are local to London. Um, there are like many different reasons why, like, yeah, why a material is valuable and why a product is valuable. Yeah, Peter, you talk about the, the final product and people want to see that final product. And, um, you know, we, we have 3D printers and, and every um, collaborator's client, they say, they, they kind of, this is being printed in in your studio, and 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 it's you know, and you know the material, and, and then they, it starts triggering curiosity because if it's being printed in front of you, can what what is the file and show me the software, and then uh, what about the material? Like, and I think because um, digital fabrication and all these sort of new tools have uh, deconstructed the idea of final product, I think, and has enabled curiosity um, and a sort of a sort of prosumer attitude where the what we call consumer can now have a direct impact with the factory in front of them as opposed to it being sent somewhere uh, in a factory far away and coming back. It's a sort of immediacy in front of the thing. And, uh, and that's been really encouraging to, uh, to see that. Uh, I, th I think as well, like sort of the, the mystification of things that come out of factories yeah. is at the core of kind of overconsumption where you order something from Amazon and it comes to your house, you have no idea how it's made. Yeah. And the maker community is all about um, seeing it happening and having a, a direct connection to the thing that you are consuming. Yeah. Um, I'm aware, sorry, I could go on with so many more questions, but I wanted, we're, we're rapidly running out of time, so I wanted to throw open, we could probably got time for, for a question or two from the audience if anybody wants to pose them to our designers today. Yeah? can share it with us on doing projects at the moment. So the question is about needing resources in relation to, and, and specifically, what sort of information are you looking for? So does anybody, has anybody got any response? I suppose the question is how can people that want to be responsible manufacturers get more information about materials? Has anybody got any points for that? It's a really tricky one. A AHEC is a good one to start with. If you go on the AHEC, I don't know if they cover Canada as well, um, but they do North America and they have on their website, they have incredible data on all of the species that are probably spread up into Canada as well. You know, AHEC, the American Hardwood Export Council. But if you look at their website, it's extremely deep. Yeah, so they're around the, the design festival and they have extremely detailed information on all of the wood species, where it's come from, where it originated from, like historically. And um, um, we output magazines. So we, yeah, I mean, we do material consultancy on a, on a case by case basis. I guess um, the thing I would ask is, can you take a local first approach? Is there, and I, and I know often that has cost implications, but is there, yeah, 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 it's a tricky one. I'm happy to grab after to see if you can, if I can put anything. I mean, I suppose, yeah, um, I was just thinking there was a website resource. There. Anyway, lost it. But yeah, it's a difficult one. Th 
there are various material libraries called uh, th uh, places like there's Materio in Paris. There's one called uh, that's run by a tile firm in um, Oxford Circus, isn't it? I can't remember what's it called. Anyone? Materials Lab. Mat um, yeah, there's that. There, there are, I reckon if you just even whacked into Google, materials library. So places like Materials Lab, which is run by, I think it's Johnson's Tiles. So they, they, they focus on tiles, but they do have quite a wide range. There are other trade shows as well. There's, um, oh God, this is testing me. Sur is it Surfex? Um, I mean, they, so obviously it's, you know, things are just ramping back up, but there are various material trade shows as well where, where specifiers go to exhibit, which might be worth you looking at. I think we've got time for just one more question. Anyone else? Yeah, front row. Oh, um, you all seem to be really deeply connected to and inspired by nature, much more than the average person. And I really helped it shine and made me see nature in a different way. Um, can you describe your relationship with nature, whether that be spiritually, philosophically? Just like oh, what an amazing question. <laughs> it's me. One question to ask. That's true. Yeah. yeah, philosophically, definitely. Uh, and I would recommend you, I don't know if it's been um, uh, translated yet, uh, but this book called Metamorphose by uh, an Italian author. He's written in French, though. Uh, he's called Emanuele Coccia, like an amazing book, uh, really inspiring, like really telling you like literally the connection of nature and how everything is interconnected. We are, we are all matter and everything transforms, you know, like you and yeah, you're part of the stars. Let's be philosophical. Um, but um, I would say this is, for my point of view, it's, it happened in my education. Uh, I was studying design in Paris, textiles, but I think I was quite frustrated by the fact that it was just doing nice things uh, and weaving, like it's a great artisanal and, and a great craft, but I was missing this kind of responsibility. And this is something that I really, I'm really thankful uh, to this course that I've done here uh, at Central St. Martins, where I was teach to basically analyze our world, being able to uh, being aware like of what's going on and and uh, particularly now with this ecological challenge it's more than ever the time to be aware where do we come from and what is our impact and how as a designer yeah we can play our role you know uh, this is a great question. Uh, when you walk in a forest or you, you look at natural things and you just like, yeah, it raises the question of design and, 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 and of course people wonder if it's created or not. And then when you know the, 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 the evolution that it had to go through and the number of rules and parameters and slight modification over billions of years and if you study design it's kind of i always felt really like humble and that I, I i didn't even trust this word anymore design because have they been designed or have they just followed rules and and their environment and respectfully building equilibrium and if that's the case then how should we do anything you know and and, and that's a very deep question that and I think one of the reasons maybe the, the work that we do looks natural is because we sort of remove ourselves a little bit and like just let parameters, whether it's the material, the machines, the, the just kind of do their thing and, and, and let it speak to us. <laughs> well, yeah, just building on your point as well, that um, I think I have a, since graduating, I've maybe developed a bit of a stranger romantic relationship to timber in particular, in the kind of like you're saying that this thing has perfected itself over billions of years, and then the connection straight back to the beginning of human beings and using a material like timber that we still use some of the same processes that would have been used then that we do now. Um, and I do find it a really fascinating and baffling material that it can grow from something like cliche, so tiny, through to something that can sustain and support buildings and large structures all the way down through to furniture and tiny little objects. And I think that's my main connection, I think, with nature. 
I'll finish by being completely contrary and say I far more prefer cities and uh, human activity <laughs> when I go away. I, I like I like going to a forest, but I actually prefer being in a city. I kind of quite conscious never to be too um, for the conversation to go towards anti-human, um, the the anti-human, because I think what we've done is is phenomenal, and I think that's it should be kind of respected and appreciated as well. And I see the differences between different people all around the world is endlessly fascinating and the way that we build and create things is like a huge source of inspiration for me, be it a litter bin or an envelope or anything. That was just an amazing question to end with, thank you. And, th and I think just building on what, you know, just to wrap up, I think, the, the, and the one point I wanted to end with is that we are living organisms within a living planet and I think we often forget that we are of nature we are with you know we and um uh, and indeed materials are you know of regardless of whether it's a smartphone or you know it's it's come from animal vegetable mineral and I think that's a really important aspect for you know to, to, to sort of bear in mind and um I'm actually involved in a project called the bioleadership project and um, and we're um it, it's it's an organization and we're working on the bioleadership design lab to actually challenge uh, I suppose we have quite a dominant methodology within the design industry which has been you know very centered on being human centered and actually what does that mean to combine a human centered and a planet centered approach um, and and actually is it time I think design is having a difficult time at the moment we're kind of you know flailing around trying to find our feet so uh, I think you know to have to, to, to keep questioning that is really incredible and, and like you say Peter to think of human not as you know separate to nature but part of nature and not make sure we don't just idealize the natural world and put it on in this pedestal um so yeah thank you so much for for your attention today it's been really amazing to be surrounded by four just incredibly inspiring people and I hope that you'll be able to take away some some ideas um and um, and it's lovely to see you. I mean, I'm just so excited to be in a physical space with physical people. <laughs> yeah, thank you so much. And sorry we've run over a bit today. Have a good day. Thank you.